Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us here on Smithsonian Science How. We have a really awesome program today about volcanoes. We are joined by geologist Dr. Ben Andrews from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Ben, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, it's a great pleasure to be here. So you're a geologist here at the Smithsonian mm -hmm. and you specialize in volcanoes, but what specifically? That's right, I study volcanoes and I look at volcanic eruptions. I look at how volcanoes erupt beginning with magma storage deep in the crust, maybe five or six or ten kilometers below our feet, then magma coming up to the surface, and then how does that, mag how does that magma erupt? Does it come out as a lava flow or as an explosive eruption of pumice and ash like we see in this picture of Mount St. Helens? So that is characterized as an explosive eruption. That's right. This, this next picture is also of Mount St. Helens, and these are both explosive er eruptions where we have great big clouds of pumice and ash and gas that are coming out and ultimately can cause a lot of hazards. So you have a demonstration here for us today to mm -hmm. help explain the difference between an explosive volcano eruption like we just saw and something else like a lava flow that comes down the side of a volcano. That's right. So if we want to think about why volcanoes explode, it all comes down to dissolved gas. So we have right here, you a know what comes next. Soda. That's right. You've, you've, you've <laughs> or seen is this, this a model. <laughs> this is a model. This is not a volcano. It's a, it's a bottle of soda. But we can use this model to understand how real volcanoes work. And real volcanoes explode because there's gas that's dissolved inside of that magma. And if the gas is able to escape very slowly, we have an eruption of lava. But if the gas doesn't escape and instead comes out really fast and comes out with the magma, we have an explosive eruption. So if I were to take this and open it up real fast, what would happen? You'd have one less friend. I'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I'd get really wet. That's right. So we're not going to do that. But instead, if I, let this, if I let the gas out very slowly, we'll hear a hiss. There it is. And we can now see that, that the gas is escaping without exploding. And this is what allows lava to erupt rather than an, an explosive eruption. So going back to what is um, kind of coming out here, we mm -hmm. see this fast bubbles. This is the explosive eruption. That's right. So when the bubbles, if the bubbles come out of solution very quickly, that is they, they exsolve. So they form just like we saw the bubbles form in the soda. If those bubbles come out very quickly, and they don't have time to escape or to get away from the liquid, then they explode that liquid out with them. They carry it out with them, and that's what happens in an explosive eruption. So let's talk a little bit about the differences between what is coming out of the volcano mm -hmm. then, because sure. if you have that slow kind of the gases escape and then the lava mm -hmm. comes out versus an explosive eruption, what is that ash made of? Is it the same material? Well, chemically it's the same. The difference between a lava and a pumice and a piece of ash has nothing to do with the chemistry or the composition, but it does have a lot to do with whether or not there's bubbles. So right here I have a bag of pumice and ash that were erupted in the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. I'm going to pour some of this out. So I see clouds of That's ash right. there's coming clouds up of ash. right now, even on our table. Even on our table. And right here we can see that this, this pile right here, there's some big pieces of pumice right here. This is a piece of frozen magma foam. And then there's littler pieces, and ultimately there's little tiny things that are smaller than grains of sand. Those little pieces are bits of frozen magma foam, little bits of, of glassy, glassy foam. It's sharp, it's full of bubbles. That's what's in an explosive eruption. We have gas coming out and ash, which is little pieces of rock, and pumice, which are bigger pieces of rock. And all of that is very sharp and very dangerous. <laughs> That's right. You, you would not want to breathe this in, or you wouldn't want to have it get into your airplane engine, or even if you had a bunch of this land on the roof of your house, that would also cause a problem. So this right here is a picture of Mayon Volcano in the Philippines, and we can see a great big cloud of ash and gas coming down the side of the volcano. And this is a microscope view of what that ash looks like. This is a piece of, it looks like a piece of foam, because it is. It's, it's glass, and it's full of little tiny bubbles, and the size there, that's about as big as three human hairs. One human hair is generally about 30 microns across, that scale bar was 30 microns. So we can see that ash is very small, full of very tiny, very, very tiny bubbles. Now help us understand the difference between this ash and lava that we might mm -hmm. be more familiar with. Sure. So we're, we'll come back to our, our little magma, our eruption simulator here. So if we take, a, take our, our magma, <laughs> pour it in here, the foamy bit that'll come, that should come up on top, that's essentially like the pumice. Well. Not so foamy today, but the pumice, <laughs> the pumice would be the magma foam, and the, the black part here, where there's no more bubbles, that's like lava. And we have examples of that here on the table. 
where we have a piece of obsidian lava right here. This is almost no bubbles at all. This is essentially a great big piece of volcanic glass. And right next to it, in white, we have a pumice that's also a piece of volcanic glass. And this piece of volcanic glass, though, is full of bubbles. This is about 75% bubbles. But if you were to grind this up and grind this one up, the pumice and the obsidian would look exactly the same. They're the same composition, the same flavor of magma. One has bubbles and exploded. That's the pumice. One flowed out without any bubbles, and that's the obsidian. And when this was flowing out, that's a much different um, occurrence than when ash is exploding out of a volcano. Isn't that right? That's right. When, that, when these lavas ooze, like we see in this movie right here, they don't move, generally they don't move very fast at all. This is a time-lapse movie showing one hour of a lava flow in Hawaii happening in one minute. So it doesn't move very fast at all. We might even see some people run around in the background. And <laughs> there they are. You can see this thing doesn't move quickly at all. It's moving much less than a meter per second. You could walk away from that, no trouble. It, it's very, very slow. A pyroclastic flow, on the other hand, moves very, very quickly. Pyroclastic flows oftentimes move at speeds of 30 or 50 or even 100 meters per second. Now to put that in perspective, that's three or even 10 times faster than the fastest human has ever run. Wow, that's incredible. It is. And kind of scary now it is. knowing that's right. <laughs> what it's all made up of. Mm -hmm. That's right. They, these clouds look fluffy, but they're, they're not. They're full of sharp pieces of glass and rock. So. And, and so we've seen a couple of pictures of these explosive eruptions, and they look like they extend way higher than the actual volcano, that mountain that it's coming out of. Um, how is that behavior happening? So as these, as these pyroclastic flows move, like we see in this picture right here, it's moving down the side of the mountain, down the side of the volcano. But as they move, they mix air in. And because they mix air in, they can become buoyant and they can start to rise like a hot air balloon. If you take air, you heat it up, it expands. That lets these clouds rise up, like we see again in these pictures of pyroclastic flows from my own volcano in the Philippines. So you have all these people right here that are at a safe distance watching some pretty spectacular and pretty terrifying eruptions of pyroclastic flows. Now in this, this movie right here, we can see an eruption from Calbuco Volcano in Chile. And this is showing us of what happens when a volcanic eruption entrains enough air or mixes in enough air that it rises from the beginning. So this ash and gas is coming out. It mixes. It rises up to 20 or 10 kilometers up in the air and spreads buoyantly. Whereas in this one here, we have a smaller eruption in Mount St. Helens that didn't mix in enough air, and so it collapsed as a pyroclastic flow. And you use the word entrain. Mm -hmm. that, what does that word mean? Entrain is just another way of saying mix. Got it. So yep. it's mixing with that air, and it's rising mm -hmm. up. That's right. Well, then, you've laid some great groundwork for what a pyroclastic flow is and what a lava flow is and how they're a little bit different. Let's check in with our visitors and see um, and give them an opportunity to participate in a live poll. Viewers, here's an opportunity to participate in a live poll with us. Tell us what you think by responding to the poll that appears to the right of your video screen. Tell us, compared to lava flows, pyroclastic flows, the things that Ben studies, are hotter, faster, denser, safer, or predictable. Put your answer in the window that appears to the right of your video screen. And remember that this is the same place where you can post questions for Dr. Ben Andrews to answer on air today, or volcanologist Ed Vensky in the chat window will respond to you in the chat. Ben and I are watching your results come in, and 89% of you think that pyroclastic flows are faster. So recapping a little bit about speed. That's right. That's right. Pyroclastic flows move at very high speed. They might move at 30, 50, or even 100 meters per second, which is three or even 10 times faster than a person can run, the fastest person can run. <laughs> Whereas lava flows are much slower. They oftentimes move at less than a meter per second. There's something that, that you could walk away from, whereas a pyroclastic flow is something that even a car would, might not be able to make it away from. So let's revisit some of those other poll answers that were up there. How about temperature? How do pyroclastic flows compare to lava flows? So pyroclastic flows are just about always going to be colder than a lava flow. And that's because pyroclastic flows mix in air, which has the effect of cooling them down. And we have a demo that we can do right there, if that's OK with you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I see you're a coffee drinker. Yeah, of course. So if we take these, these two cups of coffee right here and we take their temperature, we should see that they're pretty warm. So here's your thermometer. So This is not the one I have in my kitchen. No, this is actually the type of thermometer we could stab this into lava and get its temperature. Oh, very but, cool. <laughs> but we have coffee we today have coffee. instead. So if we look right here, we can see that this cup of coffee has a temperature of 43 degrees Celsius. 44, maybe. This cup here is also 44, which is good. They were 
to the same temperature. Now if we were to mix in some cream into here, this cream has a, has a lower temperature of 21 degrees. So what ha what's going to happen to the temperature of the coffee if I add some cream to it? My hypothesis is that it will get colder. That's right. So let's see. If we have this guy here and we add some cream, this was at 44 degrees. If we add cream into there, we see that we've just cooled this off by about 4 degrees. Now, the, what we've done here, we've cooled it off, we've added new, added new material, we've added cream to this, but we haven't changed the amount of coffee that was in there. There's still the same amount of coffee. So this is what's happening in a pyroclastic flow. It starts out hot, but it mixes in cold air. That has the effect of cooling down the pyroclastic flow. Well, and here we see the difference here between this red hot magma and the pyroclastic flow. That's right. This red hot lava on the right is glowing, which means that it's at least 600 or 700 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than a pizza oven. Whereas on the pyroclastic eruption to the left, we can see it's not glowing, and we also know that it's mixed in air. So this is going to be much cooler. It's still, it's still hot for you and I, <laughs> but it's much cooler than that lava. So what about one of those other options, density? Mm -hmm. um, how dense is a pyroclastic flow con um, compared to lava? Well, let's start with the lava. A lava is essentially, or it is, solid molten rock. So that means that this is, like this lava here, this has a density that's about, uh, about a thousand times, sorry, about two and a half times the density of water, or about 2,000 times the density of air. So this is, it's a solid rock. Now if we look at a pyroclastic flow, it has some rocks in it, but it also has a whole lot of gas. The density of, of a pyroclastic flow is about eight or 10 times the density of air, or about 100 times less than the density of water. So we can see then that the difference between, in their densities is huge. We also see differences in their deposits. This picture here is showing us a series of volcanic eruption deposits in Kamchatka, Russia, and those brown layers, the brown and sort of orange layers are soils, and in between them there's all these layers of gray and white and sort of yellowy white speckledy pumice falls and ash layers, and those are all from explosive eruptions. Those, those layers are composed of lots of individual little rocks just setting down one on top of, one on top of another. That's very different from this picture of a big cliff of lava in Hawaii. This is that, that red hot lava flowing down the side is an eruption from Mauna Ulu, and it's flowing into the Makuapui pit crater. That's a crater that looks like at least 100 meters deep, and all of those horizontal layers there are previous lava flows. Wow. So it's just layer upon layer of solid rock. And we see that again here, where this is a lava flow in Oregon that's a, a different type of lava, but the front of this lava flow is made up of really big pieces of rock, maybe the size of a refrigerator or the size of a car, but the interior is just solid rock. Interesting. Now, you've kind of laid the foundation for what a pyroclastic flow is. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hot, but not as hot as lava. Right. It's not as dense as lava, mm -hmm. but it's very fast yes. <laughs> and very dangerous. Yes. <laughs> now, does that pose any kind of air hazard um, for aviation or mm -hmm. even people? Yep, absolutely. Pyroclastic flows are one of the, the biggest hazards that a volcano can pose to people and to property. And that's because they move very quickly. The first thing we'll talk about is their aviation hazard. So in all of these pictures we've seen of pyroclastic flows, there's a current going across the ground, but there's also ash that's lifting up into the air to make a plume. And we see that here in this picture of Redoubt Volcano erupting in 1989, and there's a, the mountain is that, that volcano-looking mountain on the left side, but the big ash plume is not rising from the top of the mountain. Instead, it's rising from a pyroclastic flow that erupted a few minutes before this picture was taken. All of the ash from that eruption or a lot of that ash has lifted off to form a plume that ultimately went up to 8 or 10 kilometers altitude, which happens to be about how high airplanes fly. Now you might remember about seven years ago there was an eruption in Iceland of Eyfjall the Yerkel volcano, and we see a picture of that here from a satellite. That big brown stripe going down the middle of the frame is the ash plume from this eruption. It wasn't a very big eruption, but it shut down air traffic over all of Europe for about two and a half weeks and caused several billion dollars worth of economic danger. Wow, that's catastrophic for it the economy. It was very big, yeah. <laughs> it's a big deal. And especially from not that large of an eruption, that's right. as you it, just it, said. It wasn't a very big eruption. It didn't hurt anyone, which is very good, but it caused a whole lot of economic damage. Now, what about the ground hazard? What happens when this flow comes down the side of the mountain? What happens if you're in its path? So it's these, these pyroclastic flows, they often look like a big fluffy cloud. But there are big fluffy clouds that's full of pieces of broken glass, big rocks, hot rocks. It's more like a big superheated sandblasting cloud, and it destroys almost everything in its path. And we see evidence of that right here. This is a picture of all the remains of a wall of a structure 
in, in the El Chichon eruption in Mexico. This happened in 1982, and a, py a pyroclastic flow erupted from this volcano, and it knocked down almost everything. We can see the remains of the forest in the background, and all the remains of this building is a little piece of the wall, and the rebar that used to hold part of that wall up, or help hold that concrete wall up, has been bent and twisted off to the left. Wow, that's really powerful. It's, it's incredibly powerful and, and terrifying. We see it, another evidence here from an eruption at Montserrat in the West Indies. And right here, all of the, the green is, is grass and plants, but all of that's been covered by pyroclastic flow deposits, which are in the grayish brown color. And you can see some buildings there that were largely destroyed by this eruption. And again, this was not a particularly big eruption. So as somebody who studies pyroclastic flows, you must have like the most dangerous <laughs> job on earth. <laughs> do you ever actually get to go out into the field to study these? I, I do get to go to the field. I, we like to say though that it's, it's only dangerous if I'm doing the job wrong. <laughs> so, so the ways that we study these volcanoes, one way is to go into the field and we can look at an active eruption like this one here. This is showing Santiaguito volcano in Guatemala and we're sitting on the top of Santa Maria volcano looking down at this. So this is one of the few places in the world where you can safely watch an explosive eruption because we're about two and a half kilometers away and a kilometer above it. Now when we're at these volcanoes, we use various cameras and other instruments to, to get close-up views. So we can see that with this camera right here. We can use video cameras. We can use temperature cameras like this thermal IR video showing us the lava lake at Kilauea. That's about three football fields across right there and full of liquid, liquid lava. We can also study volcanoes using geophysical techniques like seismology. And to do that, we listen for the earthquakes, and by locating those earthquakes and looking at how those earthquakes sound, we can then see where the magma is, is the magma moving, what are the rocks doing, and we can ultimately get a great handle on what's happening below the ground. So can you use these um, different streams of data to be able to model volcanoes? Absolutely. And one, one way that we can do that is we can combine our field observations into numerical models. And we see a picture of that right here where we have a numerical simulation or a computer model showing the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Italy. And we have the eruption column come up and then it starts to collapse and make py pyroclastic flows. And we can see right here that this, this particular model would let us understand where pyroclastic flows might go, how far they might extend into the surrounding city. We can also do tabletop experiments or, or analog experiments Sort of like this one here, where we have a volcano made out of clay. And a lot of my work, we do this. We aren't making volcanoes out of clay. We're playing with some other things we'll see in a few minutes. But by doing, doing these experiments, we can understand how natural systems work in a very controlled and safe manner. We want to check back in with our viewers to give you a chance to tell us what you think in a live poll. So tell us, to model a pyroclastic flow, you will need to build a small volcano, make 1,000 degree gas erupt, make ash spew out, make a mixture of gas and ash, or make big chunks fly out. Take a moment to think about it and put your response in the window that appears to the right of your video screen. We're watching all of your responses come in, and most of you, 60% of you say, build a small volcano. What do you think, mm -hmm. Ben? Well, that was actually a bit of a trick question that we offered them, <laughs> because it turns out all of those answers are correct, depending on what question we're asking. So if we were asking a question about how might lava flows or pyroclastic flows behave at a particular volcano, where might they go, we might want to build a, a model of that volcano. And so that would be a great answer, like 60% like of you said. If, on the other hand, we wanted to study how hot lava or how hot ash interacts with the ground and what it does when it lands in a swamp and makes that swamp explode or when it hits a building, we might then want to make very hot ash. If, on the other hand, you're doing what I study, which is to understand how far and how fast pyroclastic flows go, for that we would use a mixture of ash and gas. So that's your big research question. That's right. I, looked, I generally try and study how fast do pyroclastic flows go how far do they go, and ultimately, when and where do they lift off to make a buoyant plume? So you're going to show us in a video clip in a moment how you do that in mm -hmm. your lab. But first, can you explain to us a little bit more about how that pyroclastic flow can lift up? Sure. So if we think about a pyroclastic flow, we can also call it a pyroclastic density current. And we can break that name apart. Pyroclastic, so this would mean uh, fire and broken, or fire rock. That's pretty simple. It's volcanic rock. And then density current. So the density part has to be, means that it's moving because it's denser than the air. This, is, this means that pyroclastic flows or pyroclastic density currents start out very similar to an avalanche. 
and that is they're both moving because they're denser than the air. So in our little cartoon here, we can see the snow avalanche goes down the side of the mountain because it's a big cloud of ice and snow. It's denser than the air, so it moves across the ground. The same thing happens in a pyroclastic flow. But in the case of a pyroclastic flow, because it's hot, any air that it mixes in, it heats up and expands. And as we've talked about earlier, buoyant things rise. And so if we take this, air, if we take this pyroclastic flow, we add volume to it, and we lower its density, pretty soon it's no longer denser than the air, and now it can lift off and rise like a hot air balloon. Well, let's take a look at how you model that in mm -hmm. your experimental space here at the Smithsonian. Uh, we have a video to see. Welcome to the Experimental Volcanology Laboratory. This is a great big box that we built, inside of which we can make small volcanic eruptions. Volcanic eruptions are often very, very large and very dangerous. But this is a facility that we can use to make very small eruptions that aren't dangerous at all. A natural volcanic eruption might have a cloud of ash that's moving at 100 miles per hour, and it might be 500 degrees Celsius. Now, that's super dangerous, but this thing behind us makes little currents that move at about one meter per second, and they're also only about two degrees warmer than the room. So that's not very hot at all. And this is a great big box that's 28 feet long, 20 feet across, and from the floor up to the ceiling, it's eight and a half feet tall. This is built on top of a commercial stage, and it's framed with two by fours, plastic sheeting, and then again we have plexiglass that lets us see inside of the tank. And inside of there, we have temperature sensors, which outside of the tank make this crazy mess of yellow wires. Part of the way that we watch our experiments is using lasers. We use the laser to make a great big sheet of light that allows us to see one slice of the experiment. Of course, in this case, we're using three different colors, a red laser, a green laser, and a blue laser, so we get to see three different slices of the experiment all at the same time. Now, the lasers that we use are about 100 times more powerful than the laser pointer in a classroom. So when I go inside of the tank to either clean the experiments or if I have to adjust the lasers, then I have to wear laser safety glasses. So these glasses right here block the laser light and prevent it from coming in and hurting me. So we got an awesome view there. Thank you, Ben, yeah. so much for inviting us out there. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> I mean, we saw how you're basically replicating that big fluffy mm -hmm. part, which isn't actually fluffy at all. That's right. <laughs> it looks fluffy, but it's not. And you're using laser beams. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we have a fun new addition here um, on our set, and you're going to show us exactly how you use these laser beams in your experiments. That's right. So first, I'm going to hand you some laser safety glasses. All right. So we, we use lasers because we want to see inside of our inside of our experiment. We want to be able to slice and dice that pyroclastic flow and see what's happening inside of it. And we can use lasers to make a very, essentially to make a sheet of light that goes right down the middle of the experiment or wherever we want to put it. So that's what I brought here today is a, is a laser and a lens. We're going to see how that works. And these are to keep our eyes safe? That's right. So these, the beauty of these laser glasses is they keep the laser radiation from hurting our eyes. This is good. The downside is we can't actually see the laser. <laughs> So that's, a, that's the funny part about laser safety glasses. So I'm going to turn this laser on right here. So we're going to depend on our camera crew here to tell us if you can actually see the laser. We can't All right. see it. And All right, we hear you see so it. So right here, we can see this amazing laser beam right there. Oh, just a second. we have to shift a little bit. There we go. All right. Now, if I, were to, if I were to put a lens there in front of this, we can turn this beam into a sheet. So right there, we've now turned this, we've turned this beam into now a horizontal sheet. And we can do this in the lab. We can use a whole bunch of different lasers. And so we can have great big sheets that are illuminating the entire experiment. So you're slicing and dicing using laser beams and lenses, which are That's these right. glass rods. That's right. So we're going to turn this off. So cool. So you mentioned that you use three different colored lasers. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I use red lasers and green lasers and blue lasers. And that's because our cameras have pixels that are sensitive to red and green and blue. 
So we can take our video data that we collect in an experiment, and we can separate that into a red, a green, and a blue. And therefore, we can get independent planes that give us different views of what's going on in our current, like we see in the cartoon there, where we have a horizontal plane in blue, a vertical plane in green, and another vertical plane in red. So when you're in the lab, it looks really fun. You get to simulate <laughs> these volcanic eruptions. Do you do it all day long until your camera footage runs out? And you're well, <laughs> well, yes and no. We certainly run out of memory cards a lot, and we run out of camera batteries a lot. But for every experiment that lasts maybe 100 seconds, I spend about a half hour cleaning the tank. Okay, so can you tell us um, how you're visualizing these results to sure. be able to better understand pyroclastic flows? Sure. Well, one, one of the big questions that I'm looking at is how do these pyroclastic flows mix air? And to do that, we want to understand how the volume of the current changes and also how its surface area changes. And we can do that using our lasers and a high-speed camera, and we can make 3D measurements of these, of these model pyroclastic flows. So in the bottom picture here, we have a cold cur current or an ambient temperature current, and this would be like a snow avalanche. Even though it mixes in air, it never becomes buoyant and it just flows out across the floor of the tank. The difference in the upper current is that it's a hot one, so when it mixes in air, it lifts off because it becomes less dense than the air and it rises buoyantly. So how do these experiments compare in scale <laughs> to a real volcanic eruption? Well, if, if we remember a real volcanic eruption, it might be... 500 degrees Celsius, moving at 100 meters per second, and it's like 200 meters thick. Totally deadly. Deadly and terrifying. My experiments are about 100 times smaller in all ways. They're like one meter per second, two degrees warmer than the room, and less than a meter thick. They're, my experiments also differ in the deposits that leave. So this, that previous picture was showing Mount St. Helens, and that was about a 10 or 20 meter thick deposit from one afternoon of pyroclastic flows. My currents leave deposits that are like a tenth of a millimeter thick, <laughs> so not very thick at all. You can sneeze those away. You, you can and you do. <laughs> ben, thank you so much for helping us better understand pyroclastic flows and how mm -hmm. you found these really innovative and creative ways to model them in the um, safety of your lab. Sure, thank you very much. So Ben, we are unfortunately all out of time. Thank you viewers for all of your wonderful questions. We're sorry we can't get to all of them. Uh, ben, where can our viewers learn more about volcanoes? One great resource is the Global Volcanism Program, and our website is volcano.si.edu. And if you go to our website and look at the Learn tab, you can find all sorts of resources, including image galleries showing photos of volcanoes and different types of volcanic processes. We have the Eruptions, Earthquakes, and Emissions app, which is an animation showing the last almost 60 years of eruptions, earthquakes, and volcanic emissions that have happened around the world. And we also have profile pages for all of the world's 1,449 active volcanoes. Wow. It's a great, pretty great resource. resource. <laughs> ben, thank you so much for being here with us thank and you. introducing us to pyroclastic flows. Thanks. And viewers, thank you so much for tuning in today and sending in all of your wonderful questions. We're sorry we didn't get to all of them. If you want to see this broadcast again, it'll be archived later this evening at curious.si.edu, which is the same place where you can find resources about volcanoes and Ben's work. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you next time on Smithsonian Science How.